So good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club and our panel discussion on strengthening the social safety net. My name is KP Naidu, and I'm the VP of Labs at Benetech. This is my first month at Benetech, so go easy on me. <laughs> <laughs> and I oversee our community-driven data platforms. Um, Benetech, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we're a nonprofit, and uh, we um, our mission, we're a technology organization, and our mission is to empower communities with software uh, for social good. ServiceNet, which is part of our focus on poverty alleviation, is a platform that makes it easier for organizations providing services as part of the safety net to share and maintain data on those services. This helps them make timely and accurate referrals to individuals and families and increase access to human services. And this, last statistic, this statistic kind of caught me, which is for some of the 1.7 million people living below or at the poverty line in the Bay Area. Um, and this is why we're hosting this event dedicated to making human services more human. So in addition to our speakers, I know in the evening we have in the audience members from organizations which support and provide critical services to support the community. So please stay afterwards and share your work and connect with each other because I think we, one of the things is to actually make those connections. My colleague Neil McKechnie is back there and he will share some information about ServiceNet if you're interested after the panel. So with the holiday season upon us and with the ongoing devastation from the recent fires, we're all thinking about the social safety net, who it serves and how well it is working or not. This is a serious and complex situation that cities and communities across the Bay Area and beyond are trying to solve. A few years ago, I worked uh, at Santa Clara County as their director of IT operations, and I saw firsthand how collaborative data sharing platform could actually add tremendous value to county departments and the agencies which they contract and which they actually um, fund to provide critical services which many of us may need or know somebody who, who does uh, need that. With that, let me introduce our panel. We're all in, involved in ServiceNet as partners or funders. We have Kelly Batson from United Way Bay Area, Sherry Novik from Kaiser Permanente, Aaron Connor from Cisco Foundation, and last but not least, the CEO of Benetech, Betsy Bowman. Sherry, I'd like to convey our condolences to everyone at Kaiser for your recent loss with the passing of your CEO, mm -hmm. Bernard Tyson. Thank you very much. Tonight, we are discussing the very issues he championed, <laughs> addressing homelessness with humanity and recognizing that health is much more than what happens in the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. Thus leading Kaiser Permanent is deep involvement in social care as well as medical care. While everyone on the panel is involved with ServiceNet Pilot in some way, our panel will discuss the broader work which their organizations are doing to make human services more human and how we can and should come together to strengthen the social safety net. To lead and moderate the discussion, I'm pleased to introduce Kevin Fagan from the San Francisco Chronicle. Kevin has been covering some of the most vulnerable populations and issues like homelessness and addiction for decades. He has met with and written about individuals who rely on the social safety net and the suffering they endure when the net frays and let the, lets them down. So please join me in welcoming our panel. Okay, good, good sound crew. Always like that. <laughs> I, I'm really happy to be here because uh, uh, not only do you guys do pretty amazing, innovative things, uh, some which would, of which I had been aware of before, but which I've now become more aware of. Uh, but um, at the Chronicle, we and I really care about doing the right thing. Um, uh, I've been covering homelessness and poverty and well, serial killers and disasters for decades. And it's it, 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 watching people die, watching people fail, and then watching a few of them succeed uh, can break your, well, it does break your heart. Uh, and one of the things that has come home to me after decades of, of following desperate people is that when there are, are systems that tie the various services together, things work better. Uh, Many people I know uh, have been failed by uh, uh, inadequate systems. Years ago, 
uh, that one comes to mind, a woman named Little Bit, who was a very short, crack and heroin addicted street hooker, um, really smart, really wanted to get off the street in her, in, in, in her innermost self. And she kept going into the system and then being ejected. There was nowhere to put her. She'd go into the hospital, she'd go back out into the streets. She'd go into uh, uh, some kind of a, a drug treatment, she'd go back out into the streets over and over. And the only thing that finally saved her was the, 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 the good-hearted, really hard-working street counselors who did it despite some of the failings of the system. And the system has gotten better in this city and in, in many cities, because I've, I've done homelessness uh, uh, nationally for many years. Um, but it needs more. And I, I know I don't want to embarrass him, but Jeff Kasitsky is sitting back there. <coughs> he runs the city's homeless department. And one of his first priorities when he came in was to tie together a system yep. that, 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 didn't, that helped eliminate the wasting of time and the wasting of effort. And it's hard to write about in a way that people pay attention to. A lot of people's eyes glaze over. Um, you guys are a pretty select crowd. I think you're going to understand what's being said here. Uh, but it's phenomenally important to have a system that, that speaks to, the, to the, all the various uh, entities that have to serve our most desperate people. And um, the service net, I thought, was a pretty damn good idea. Uh, That's awesome. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if... Uh, uh, I guess we'll start with you. T tell me why this, I don't know how familiar everyone is with it, but it's a pretty cool thing because if we're going to do anything regionally uh, in terms of addressing homelessness as people move from county to county, it's going to be something like this that will be key to making that happen. T tell us why this is important. Yeah, so first, thanks again for everybody who's here and, you know, without pointing out like half the audience, you know, people who are in our community, our partners, actual users of ServiceNet aren't just the people up here, but some of you out here. So thank you all for coming. Um, so I've sort of come at this problem from some time back saying there is this issue when you have data causing a real human problem. Why, why can I go pull out my phone, you know, find whatever kind of food I want within five minutes of here and know when it's open, how good they are, and yet if I were a desperate, vulnerable person, that's not always so easy. I mean, we have people like Kelly doing amazing work to make that happen. But when you start talking about a region, you're not always talking about just a, a one block radius. You're talking about the entire Bay Area region you have issues that cross county lines. You have issues that cross providers of services. And so I, I know of this problem. My first startup was a social enterprise sort of focused on this problem as, as things were first kind of coming out of books and going online. Um, but the problem is still there in terms of coordination because now it's almost too easy for somebody to just say, I'm going to make a database because I can't find the resources that my folks need, so I'm going to make a database. Do they know that 211 is there? Maybe. Maybe they love it. Maybe they don't know about it. Uh, but they think, well, but I'm not finding what I need. I'm going to make one. But that happens times hundreds. So we have a lot of service providers doing great work mm -hmm. and a lot of information providers doing great work. But there is a disconnect still today that especially in a, at a regional level, how do you make sure that the, the data is flowing that there are pipes between the various communities, and I'm sure Sherry will touch on this. You know, you have groups that are doing amazing stuff as one group, but what if you need something just outside the line? Where do you find that? And so we've really looked at this as how do we engage the community, not just throw a tech solution out there, and figure out together, is there a solution that's needed and what does that look like? And so I think that's really been kind of the the nexus of ServiceNet and where it came from is sort of hearing about this problem, frankly, nationally and internationally. It isn't just mm -hmm. the Bay Area. Um, and yet hearing like there's there are needs there that just it's still not really the nut. It's not done. And so looking and talking to really smart people like the people to my right and saying, let's work together and think about, you know, regional kinds of answers that will help fix this. Yeah, and, and, and I think one of the, the, the key goals is to eliminate duplication. Absolutely. Because uh, a lot of the people I hang with, I, I spend a lot of time in the streets over the years, 
Uh, you go to, to, to uh, outpatient for methadone. Well, that didn't work. Try it again, it didn't work. Th then you try to do inpatient with Suboxone. Maybe that'll work. If you know what the history is of people in different counties, say they tried that in Santa Clara, then they come to Santa, San Francisco. You don't want to try to do the same thing that fails. If you can access what's happened and what, what is available in the various areas, it makes an enormous difference because homeless, chronically homeless people in particular, the ones you see under blankets, which are about 20 to 30, maybe 40%, depending on the city, uh, they're not going to make appointments. They're going to give them a, a sheaf. Of what, uh, you were telling me, Erin was telling me about going to a nonprofit the other day where uh, uh, yeah, she looked at the sheaf of papers each client had to fill out. Yeah. They're, they're not going to fill out the papers, and they're not going to show up the next day at 10 a.m. You've got to get them right where they are, and you have to know how to get to them um, through a system like this. Yeah, and, and I think you mentioned the, you know, saving time and redundancy. I mean, the first thing we did actually is, is engage people. We didn't write code. And then as we started to talk to groups, we actually did data analysis to see, you know, something like a 70% overlap of records between different information and referral providers, which means they're doing duplicate work. These are organizations who always need more resources and are, have a ton of stuff to do, and they're doing duplicate work. At the same token, what we also found is when you dig down, they actually had, for the same agency, different information. So not only was were they duplicating effort, making phone calls and emails and a lot of outreach, but then also the data, if you went to one referral resource, you might know that they have a website, another one you might not. One you might know they take dogs, another one doesn't mention it. So, mm -hmm. so these, are, these are critical factors if you're some of the people you're talking about, Kevin. Yeah, and it, and it used to be you would go to the, the very smart social worker who knew where the mm -hmm. things were. It shouldn't have to be left to that. It should be able to, you can dial up a system. Like yeah. Thrive Local, if uh, <laughs> Sherry's <Segway>. Kai's speaking <laughs> of. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how that works? So, so Kaiser Permanente, like I think most of the healthcare industry these days, has recognized that um, what makes someone healthy is maybe 10 or 20 percent related to having a doc going what happens in the doctor's office. I mean, it's critical, but it's such a small part of what makes people healthy. And lots of policy is pushing healthcare providers, including the the um, the the, uh, uh, the need to attain affordability. Right, no matter what happens with our healthcare system, we have to make it more affordable. So healthcare systems are looking at how do we start to address the, the larger needs. Some people talk about social determinants of health. I like to think of social drivers of health. I mean, the real determinants are things that y aren't going to get fixed by you know a referral to a food bank. The real determinants are much much more complex than that. But the drivers of health, right, do, are food insecurity, housing insecurity, lack of transportation, social isolation. Um, we, like other healthcare providers and, and others in the industry, have really s taken seriously that we have to figure out what what our members and patients need that we can't fix, but is is leading to poor health outcomes. So we actually had to make an enterprise wide. We're in eight major regions of the country. Um, uh, you know, uh, 12.3 million members. Um, we had to come up with an enterprise solution. So we actually contracted with an organization, a, a technology organization called Unite Us, which is one of a number of, you know, startups. There's lots of activity in this area. Um, their technology is actually not just a resource database, but also the, the um, the development of closed uh, networks of social service providers and others, right? So you can s you can make a referral somewhere through this through their platform and track it, see if the person got there, did they get the service they needed, um, and so that's what our care delivery system demanded. Basically, if I make a referral, I need to know what happened with it, mm -hmm. um, and so it will be interactive with our electronic health care system, uh, you know, our electronic health records, Epic, eventually. So this is sort of a thing we're doing. Many people in the room may have heard of Unite Us. Um, there's a lot of competition out there, and there are a lot of different platforms. We are pushing very hard to uh, to ensure that what we are doing with this particular vendor can link to other platforms and other vendors because we don't want one federally qualified health center to have Aunt Bertha and One Degree and Unite Us and right. So, um, so, so what we're really trying to do is actually a little farther up on the prevention um, scale, mm -hmm. which is screen our members, screen our patients. 
for certain, you know, for the sort of basic needs and get them that help. Then you might ask, yeah, so what happens to these poor service providers when they get all these referrals? We will know where we're making, for the first time, we will know where we're making referrals. Right now, social workers just make referrals. We have no record of it. So, mm -hmm. and I think that happens everywhere, you know, in, in, in welfare offices everywhere. There's just referrals being made. We'll be able to track them. We will know what pressure we, Kaiser Permanente, um, are putting on, the, on these providers. And then we will have to talk about how do we move some of the money from the healthcare medical model into the social service sector. And that's a big conversation we're hoping this pushes in that direction. Yeah, and that's one of the big challenges because health, health data, well, as a reporter, I can't get my hands <laughs> on any health data. <laughs> <laughs> but as ser service providers, it's very hard for, for you yep. to get your hands on, on an efficient and complete health data. And that's one of the, 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 the greatest challenges in, in just about every major city in the, in the country. And some cities have done it better than others. San Francisco has actually made a lot of headway on that. And you got to do some workarounds and, and come up with some new systems. But um, Cisco has tossed a lot of money recently. That's some <laughs> pretty cool programs that, that I've, I've written about. Uh, how, are, how do you choose what to go at? Because I'll tell you, I get pitched all the time by someone who wants to hack the homeless and come up with an app to help a junkie get off the street. It's not yep. that easy. How do, how do you pick? So I think you're referring to the $50 million donation mm -hmm. that we made last year uh, to Destination Home in Santa yeah. Clara County. And I have to say that's a bit different than how we normally <laughs> uh, partner and invest. Uh, and that really did come from our leadership and from the top. Uh, our, it's an issue that our CEO cares a lot about. When he came on board, he saw that we were doing great work around the world, supporting different social initiatives, but we weren't doing a whole lot in our own backyard where there was a real, is a real crisis, um, mm -hmm. and felt like the private sector needed to step up. He wanted to model that. He, um, thankfully in Santa Clara County, there had been a bond measure passed where there was a lot of public funding available for the very first time uh, to build supportive housing and housing for extremely low income populations. Um, and our, most of our funding is not actually for technology, but it's to leverage the public funding made available using really flexible private funding to help uh, compete with market rate developers, secure land, provide pre-development financing until the Measure A funding comes in and then they can revolve the funding. Mm -hmm. And so we saw a clear opportunity to put in private funding, working really closely with the public sector, who has frankly a lot more money, and it's in this for a lot longer, um, to, to build more housing, which we all believe is the solution to homelessness in Santa Clara County. And I think, you know, in, in terms of our um, partnership with Benetech, this is more a traditional way of, of investing and supporting nonprofits where we support the development of early stage technology-based solutions those that are addressing a real gap in the market mm -hmm. that is typically felt by peer organizations and others, so where there really is a path to scaling and replicating. And you know, when we first started talking to Benetech and they'd done the research, they saw the duplication of efforts. There was such a clear opportunity for technology to reduce redundancy and duplication, increase efficiencies, and improve the quality of information and services that people receive. And so for us, that was, you know, it was kind of a no-brainer. It's very aligned with, with what we, we do across our funding portfolios. Mm -hmm. Kel uh, Kelly, um, one of the, th when, when we talk about housing, uh, there's the three, the two billion dollars that Apple just put in, and a billion from Google, and a billion from Facebook. Uh, d by a lot of estimates, we need more, more like 14 billion to, to build enough housing. Uh, d d d with the kind of network that you deal with, and the and the funding uh, streams that you you manage as an organization over the years, uh, how do you find any hope in trying to reach any kind of uh, a solution with with numbers like that that are so huge, uh, hmm. you know, give us some hope. That's a good question. Wow. A hardest <laughs> question. I know. I'm so in charge far. of giving us hope. <laughs> um, yeah. I would say, I mean, I think anybody here that works in this sector would say you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, you probably say something about, you know, every individual that you get the chance to change their life or change their trajectory is is 
is good is 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 where you have to start. Um, so I mean, in terms of hope, um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of I was I was just saying this to to Betsy and KP before we started today that I feel in this sector of information providing organizations and building and the the healthcare investment and the the housing needs and the housing investment I I do feel there is this convergence of momentum and people wanting to be a part of creating the solutions um, where you know and obviously housing has been a problem here in San Francisco for a long time um, has been, you know, we've, we've been calling it a crisis for, I don't know how, how many years uh, now, probably you know, three or four years at least, mm -hmm. um, if not longer. Um, and I feel like there is, I am really encouraged by the different sectors, the different um, collaborations that are coming together to help solve the problem. It's not like any other problem before. Um, and what's exciting, I mean, I, what I, you know, if you are involved in any of these conversations, you're also seeing the, not in addition to housing, um, you know, the safety net in general um, and homelessness prevention, um, right, are all, there's, there's a lot of, of talk about what does homelessness prevention look like. Many of us in, in the nonprofit sector are doing that work, but we have never called it homelessness prevention. Um, but we're able to support a family who's on the edge, who's feeling they're on the brink of homelessness to actually, you know, get the income support they need or the other types of support they need to to prevent that um, or to at least delay it, um, you know, if not forever, because there's obviously an even larger system around income inequality and uh, unaffordability and all the things that go into that. So in terms of, I mean, I, I'm encouraged by the the working together, by the think, thinking of things differently. I went to a um, yesterday, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation had their annual meeting um, in Mountain View. I went yesterday, and they did a poll where they asked everyone, what word is more overused in Silicon Valley? And everyone, um, and there was innovation, disruption, synergy, and like yeah. innovation, of course, was the first one. So I hate to right. use that word, even though <laughs> none of you were there, and I just told you what happened. I could just <laughs> used it and never even said anything. Um, but I mean, I do really feel like thinking about things differently and trying to come at a problem differently is what is happening. Um, so that's from my perspective as a United Way and as a 211. Mm. OK. Um, regional, uh, the, the whole idea of, mm. of working regionally has been out there for, it's been a goal mm -hmm. of a lot of places, but there's territorialism. You know, counties don't want to yeah. necessarily uh, d cooperate. And, and you go to, d s say, uh, Contra Costa goes to Alameda County and says, you've got a lot of housing here. Take our people. How do you overcome that uh, and, and, and convince people to share their resources and, and information? Yeah, I can't. I can't solve the share the people problem. All but right. the but the share the resources thing. You know, that's been a journey in this project that I th I'd say we're still on. Um, which you know, I, I often tell people, ServiceNet is a trust system, because our goal is to actually enable Kelly and her counterparts all around the region mm -hmm. to share their data, which you know we're not we're not handling people's information. So you know. Definitely Sherry and some of the stuff they're doing may, may have people records. We in ServiceNet are really trying to say, how do we do that publicly available data about the services and do it really, really well? But even then, you know, it took a bit of like discussion to say, well, we all know we want to achieve this better outcome, but wait a minute, we put a lot of our effort and we get funded to do this, to, to maintain a database. If mm -hmm. I just put it out there, if I'm somebody like Kelly who has a major database in eight counties, what happens if they put it on a shared system? And you know that has been something that we've, we've really worked through, again, with the community first before we had anything, and then starting to talk about what, what are governance rules? You know, what, what does it mean to share your data? How could it be shared? And, and literally, we started really small. I, you know, we started with, okay, you can see mine if we have the same kind of agency record, but that's it. And then, you know, we've kind of made huge progress since then, and everybody said, wow, this would be a lot more useful if we could just see all the data. And then they all said, oh, yeah, let's do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but that's not a small thing. This is like decades of work. And so, and, and now we're in this mode of growing and saying, well, now we're going to add a small number, again, of partners. You're all going to know who each other are, but this is in preparation to go very 
open. So a lot of the work we're doing and why I'm so thrilled that people like Sherry and Aaron and their teams are involved and many of the people in this room is let's talk about those different models and let's talk about, you know, it's not about us suddenly saying we're going to do it, not you. It's really let's enable you. And, and so I think to, to first they had to trust us, right? So why us? I mean, we're not a 2 one, one. We don't want to be one. They do amazing work. Let's help them. You know, mm. we are a software for social good organization. We're not coming from a point of competitiveness. Uh, and that's true with other software solutions as well. I mean, Unite Us and Thrive Local and One Degree, and uh, we're saying let's open the tent and all talk about what does this big ecosystem look like so you know mm. so that helped with trusting us i think but then it mm. was still do they trust each other and what can we do as smart systems developers to build that trust system so that you know it's it's a better way to work together that that doesn't make anybody feel like oh man i'm just giving away the store so yeah. you know yeah, because it took a lot of, it took a lot to hey, assemble the store years and years and years yeah. and lots of dollars and lots of people's time and you know and i would say we also do a lot with libraries for people with print disabilities and I know a lot of librarians mm -hmm. and there is a similarity right yeah. data curation like mm -hmm. you've got people who say I curate my database this way for a reason a very good reason that we've learned from our clients over the years our beneficiaries so don't mess with that so then you know part of our job is to take this what is frankly messy because you've got a lot of different structures yeah. and say how do you bring that together in a way that's really useful for well all the systems don't all talk to each other either yeah, so yeah. that's part of what we do is, right, how do we translate that so that if this is a blob of data and this is 25 pieces that they actually can connect. Right. I, I think that's very yeah. cool. Blob of data, right. super technical term, sorry. <laughs> I got blobs. <laughs> well, Sherry, d d tell me, d what's, what's the biggest problem you face in expanding what you're trying to do? You know, um, <clears throat> I, well, it's the trust building. You know, we are actually asking people um, and we've been in conversation with colleagues here uh, to to participate in a new um, sort of paradigm of being on a technology platform. You know, there's technology, and then there's the use of the technology. And so, what does it mean to be on a, a platform where you where you where you can share information about a client? And you know we've dealt with all of the confidentiality issues and all of that kind of stuff. Believe me, Kaiser lawyers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this a poor job. vendor. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but to join and say, okay, and, and I should say Kaiser's actually paying for the licenses of the um, CBOs to join this this platform um, under our enterprise contract. So they, we have to convince community-based organizations, social service providers, to join us in this technology where we can talk to each other, see, each, refer, see what's happened to that person. And there's a question, why should I do that? I'm already doing, I'm already providing care the way I provi provide care. Why would I do it differently? And what, what is the advantage to me? And you don't want someone telling you to do something you didn't And And, and will I be program. flooded? And will I be flooded mm -hmm. with referrals? And right. how do we manage that? And, um, and, and those are all really legitimate questions. Um, how do you counter that? Well, you know what we've 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 looked at this vendor's, um, and I'm not a advertising this vendor. Let me tell you, um, I you know I sort of feel like I don't know. There's this thing about capitalism that gets in the way sometimes of of some <laughs> collaborations. <laughs> I shouldn't say that here, right? I shouldn't say that here. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> when you were saying yeah. what what gives you hope, I was going to say something political, but I thought I better not. But it's been happening this week in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Different topic. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so no. It, you know, but it's how, how people start to be willing to try to do things differently, mm -hmm. and there is a certain level of trust. This particular technology allows a vendor not to accept a referral without having to say no to the client. It, they, they get re-referred somewhere else. So that's a protection uh. for them. How well will it work? We're taking a big, this is a big leap of faith for Kaiser Permanente to say we're, you know, we had to do one thing, we're doing it. Our leadership was adamant about we've got to start finding a way to meet the social needs, the social care needs mm -hmm. of our members. So it's all very, um, you know, it's all very new and it's all very risky. And in three years, we may find that it is working really well in some areas and not so well in other areas and we'll have to make adjustments. But prevention is huge and but it's something that doesn't get about. acknowledged much. Because yeah. the, the people that don't become homeless, you don't see them. You know, the people want the guys with the, the shopping carts off the street. The guys with the shopping carts want to get off the street. But d they're not 
a majority of the homeless population. But if you could have identified someone who maybe had a, they were behind on their utility bills. I mean, there are certain signs yeah. that lead to homelessness. And if, if with the, our own members, I mean, we don't even ask our own members if they're housing insecure or food insecure. I mean, we're starting to do it a little bit, but no physician wants to ask a question that they don't have an answer for. So that's sort of like mm -hmm. talking about, I, I'm saying bad things about all kinds of professions here. <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, oh. a doctor's not going to say, you know, do you, uh, do you have enough food at the end of the month if they don't have a thing to do for it? Because What's the challenge you have to get over? That's uh, part of what uh, And so now we're giving them about. something that mm -hmm. they can do with it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Aaron, what's the biggest problem you face in trying to pick out what to fund, what to focus on, what works? I think, hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of times it's interesting that we're talking about um, data sharing and these siloed databases because I think, you know, what we fund are innovative solutions and what we hear more and more from nonprofits and organizations in this space is their siloed information and we need a way to mm -hmm. integrate and plug in and we don't need one more standalone app that does one thing that gives us, you know, limited visibility or insight that can't be integrated with our CRM or an HMIS or something to actually benefit the organization so that they can use the data to inform their programs, their services, improve the quality of the products or services that they offer. So I think um, at least a challenge that we're seeing among the organizations we support and um, in terms of technology is people don't necessarily need more databases and apps. <laughs> they need to figure out ways to uh, integrate and share data and benefit from all the technology that's already out there. To maximize what's already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 Kelly, the the um, how much willingness do you see? Because you sprawl across the whole Bay Area. How, how much willingness do you see for people to cooperate with each other? Do you see more now than five years ago? Um, I don't know if I would quantify. I mean, I think, especially. I mean, if you think about the housing space, I think you know there's many things happening in the Bay Area and California around. You know, w this isn't something one sector solves. Um, this isn't one thing that policy solves, uh, building solves, um, people working with people experiencing homelessness. There's, you know, there's so many ways to, to combat the problem. I mean, I would say, um, you know, we work at the United Way. We're focused on ending poverty here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And we do that through basic needs work, homelessness prevention, but also we're working with people on career and employment opportunities and also their financial stability. So we see that just in having to work, at, just working in those three areas where you know, we have to collaborate with so many groups and one of, our, one of the initiatives that we work on is called SparkPoint, um, where we actually in 2009 built the first one, it's unrelated to 211 and SurfNet right now, but really it's a good example of the organizations, they, th we, the model, you know, is integrated services delivery, and many organizations use that and collaborate with other agencies to provide services in one location for people and track that same person across services, track their outcomes against some larger outcomes, not output, not services received, not you know. So, um, from my perspective, I feel like I've even was in a recent conversation around, you know, someone, a housing organization in Oakland that got someone housed, um, and then. You know, once they're housed, they weren't in supportive housing necessarily, but they um, they actually did need some support and some someone to, or you know, some community services to be provided to that that person who helped them live their lives. And they, and it sounded like they needed an integrated services delivery model for that person who was you know now stably housed. But now what do I? You know, there's all these different supports that keep someone healthy and thriving and stable. Um, and so I do think there's this recognition of you know, this isn't something I do alone. Um, and I don't know if that's new in the last five years. I think, you know, many people working in this space have known that for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think there's been, you know, there is a little of this, like, this is my area and I own it. And <laughs> I don't, there's, you know, funding scarcity. People feel like I have to yeah. do it and own it and say that it's mine and not let others come in because I need the funding for my organization. So I feel like there's a little bit of that. Um, but I think mostly, you know, once people can agree on where they're headed and what the, the end goal is, there's, there's space for collaboration and a real um, desire to do that. 
Well, one of the challenges is there's no one size fits all for any of these, any, any homeless problem. Uh, and and it, it takes a lot of, a galaxy of different <coughs> kinds of services to, and you have to choose them. You have to pick them and you have to, to, to fit them. Uh, Betsy, what do you see ahead? What's, what's next? for this effort that you've been doing? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a really exciting time because we, we finished out our first six month pilot in the Bay Area with six partners, like I said, many of whom are in the room. Um, and we're now adding, um, again, adding kind of a, a relatively small number right away to finish out, again, more of this work on governance, more of this work on how is this all gonna scale? What is it gonna look like when it's much bigger and more open? Mm -hmm. And then go to town around the rest of the Bay Area. We, we are also uh, starting another pilot in Sacramento um, and another healthcare group, Dignity Health, actually Dignity, Kaiser, Sutter, and UC Davis all work together there uh, around homelessness. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting kind of a different look over there, which is how do we actually get some shelters to update their own information daily and then you know as often as we can get them updating them uh, so that referrers can you know see that right away so you know I, as a tech person I'm not going to say real time but much closer to that than just sort of this broad set of updates and part of what our community will talk about is do these models come together you know maybe there are things like um, shelters and housing food things that really, really do change during the day, not just during the year, and actually look at how real time that can get. And do these models come together? We'll see. Um, we also have a, a, a couple of areas where um, some of the groups that are likely to join already work with the groups that are already on our system. And so how can ServiceNet actually be a connector for even within that little area like legal aid services or food or others yeah. to really say, you know, well, we're trying to share data now and we're kind of making a lot of phone calls and sending emails and it's really clunky. Wow, so so we're sort of looking at uh, uh, all these different models for how this goes. Um, you know, we have been talking to people all around the U.S. and even outside the U.S. for some time because, again, this is not unique to this area. So, you know, this is the place we want to make it work first, but you know, then of course, looking at some of these more national places where some of our current partners are already working yeah. as well. Oh, and the problem is spreading around the state too. It's uh, yep. the rural areas that used to be kind of immune. Oh yeah. No, every every county now has homeless issues. Yeah, I have I have family in the Central Valley who mm -hmm. just have never seen homeless people before in their little town and it's a it's mm -hmm. an issue and they just they just have no idea what to do and if everyone's just doing their own little thing it needs to be connected mm -hmm. uh, I think we're supposed to take some questions now so I think there's a microphone that's going to be making its way who has a question oh, come on. all you smart this tech people this here crowd that totally. doing nonprofits and whatnot what do you what do you want these guys to do what do you want to hear from them Hi, my name is Neetal Tarek. I'm the founder of Innovate Social, and we do a lot of events that bring people to kind of be, be problem solvers. But I would love to hear um, where tech meets non-tech, where at actually where that gap is in between and what your vision is to kind of fill that, because tech can solve things, but it can also create its own, yep. its own issues, especially when you're working with vulnerable populations. Yep. You know, you know, I, I think we saw this with the um, advent of electronic health records, which was a revolution in healthcare, where you could really track people. But it also created a barrier between, I mean, the touching, the human, and it, and it, and it led toward looking at the data as opposed to the human being. Um, I think the healthcare industry absolutely experienced that, and we're fearful about that, about referring into a, into a technology system, sort of. Um, so I, the, the human touch um, gets lost really easily, and I mm. feel like anybody working in this, in this, anywhere that touches this field has to be committed to ensuring the human touch less, and that the touch is by a person who mm. the recipient of the touch can relate to. Um, I mean, it, it, it's not just some somebody of, you know, uh, behind a glass <laughs> wall who's, you know, someone who speaks the language, who understands the lived experience, who, so I, 
I think that we're getting much smarter about what it takes to have a meaningful human touch. We have to make that happen, and we have to ensure it's there. That's what I would say. I think the, 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 I the thing is that the tech is, is it, it's a tool. Yeah. Right. It's a, but it has to be, has to have humans enacting it. But you can, you can hide don't have behind it. You can hide behind it, you know? Yeah, you And don't we need to not hide that. behind it. But yeah. I'd also say that I think tech, yeah, it's a tool, it's an enabler, it doesn't fix things. And when there's serious flaws in systems design and how things are, are currently working, I think you don't start with the tech, just like Benetech didn't, right? You you look at the user needs. A lot of In a lot of cases, those are the people receiving services or the people providing services. Understand the process and re-engineer those and then, you know, build the technology on top of that to to streamline processes and actually make it less painful for everyone. I think we'd supported Community Solutions, which is a nonprofit out of New York that launched the 100,000 Homes campaign a number of years ago. And they mm -hmm. actually mapped the journey of a homeless veteran from living on the streets. Um, they'd been pre-identified eligible for benefits. It wasn't a lack of resources because there was housing available for veterans. Um, mapped the process from being on the street to receiving permanent housing. And on average in communities, that took 368 days. Resources mm -hmm. available, and and part of it was mm -hmm. that that veteran was touching six to seven different agencies in this process. Right. They mapped out the journey. There were 42 steps, took 368 days. They were able to bring the different organizations together to understand all the different information needs because there was duplication of that. There was, you know, where money changed hands, there were bottlenecks. They mapped out an ideal process that was 12 steps, and they reduced the, the amount of time from living on the streets to housing down to 60 days. And that wasn't even, a, that wasn't technology. So I think a lot of it is, you can't always, you know, think first about what the technology fixes. You really need to understand what, how everything needs to be reimagined and re-engineered and then enable that through technology. Yeah, I once tracked a street addict for three years uh, to see where she, what, what, what kind of services she went into, what did, what failed, and it all failed. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the most of it failed. She cost a hundred grand a year, mm -hmm. and she would have cost twenty grand a year if she had been uh, directed more efficiently into what she needed uh, through information systems. Today, some of the, the outreach counselors that that I know here, just in this city, and in Oakland too, you, you pull out the phone, click, you can figure things out quicker. Uh, and then even better across uh, county lines, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the tech, the tech makes a difference if if it's in the hands of the people doing yeah. it. Um. Hi, Kate Weiland, Sutter Health. Um, this question is for Sherry and I think Betsy mostly, but anyone's free to answer. Um, and kind of related to the last question, just in terms of. Who are the folks like on the front line using this? You know, I imagine, especially with Kaiser, it's probably social workers, discharge mm -hmm. planners, um, some of the, you know, folks at the actually at the shelters, at the community based organizations. How do you get buy in from them to like, and I'm thinking about EMRs too, like, how do you get buy in from them to add another layer to their work? Like, the long game is that this is better for them, but the short game <laughs> is that this is something new to learn and something to add to their daily workflow. Mm. How do you make sure that it like fits as well as possible into their the work they do now? Yeah. And some of you who have been watching the paper may have noticed that Kaiser Permanente has been having some difficult, <laughs> some courageous conversations with our labor unions. Um, mm. uh, it, this is this this is uh, this is hard because it is changing how we do our work. Um, and we're really just in the beginning, literally right now. I mean, I was in a meeting two days ago talking about how do you describe this in a way that is not threatening, that it's actually going to make your job better, it's going to make you feel better. And I'm going to tell you, so we're trying to find the, the resources that Kaiser Permanente is already using, that our social workers and discharge plan planners, care coordinators are using, to make sure those are in the initial, you know, we start with those, um, th those organizations. And one social worker said, it's mine. I, I can't share that information. I have personal relationships with that, mm -hmm. pr you know, that provider. So how do you, you know, how do you, it's, it's sort of the same thing yeah. you faced only on a different level. Mm -hmm. We own this. We've developed yeah. it. How do we share it? So I think it's a real human problem around changing how we think and feeling trusting. Um, ultimately, I do think that when things work, people 
kind of get, uh, I mean, who doesn't shop online, right? So, I mean, people do change when it, when it makes life easier. So we're hoping that is part of the shift. And we're also looking to our other healthcare pro providing community <laughs> to join with us in this effort. This is something I just want to say. I think that we are really seeing healthcare, you know, this is not an area for competition amongst health providers. This is an area for collaboration so we can build things together. And I'm thinking we're starting to really see that with Sutter, Dignity, Kaiser, um, you know, building together mm -hmm. and going through much of the process that you're describing, which is yeah. what can we share and how can we do it together. It yeah. is a different mindset, yeah. though, because a lot of social yeah. workers, I've talked to tons of social workers, they don't want to share because they, they feel emotionally invested in who yeah. they're helping. Yeah. They don't want someone else to mess it up. How do you get over that? Yeah, well, and it's kind of what I what I mentioned before, and, and I mean, to, to build that into your mm -hmm. question, I mean, ServiceNet, we're actually starting one step further back, so or one group further back. So groups like Kelly, who's, whose organization maintains referral data and actually has people on the phones and online, you know, answering, giving out referrals. Right now, it's actually her folks that are doing the data updates that are the users of mm -hmm. ServiceNet. Um, now that's a really different model than Shelter Tech. Um, Edward, who's here, um, you know, they actually have people outside doing data thons, and and they've actually just used ServiceNet for one of those data thons where they're updating services data, hmm. um, really actively. So so you know, again, different folks have different needs, and then you know, a big part of Neil's job is making sure that <laughs> that as we go forward how do we make it more seamless, you know, m more and more seamless for the folks that are using it. And, you know, we've talked about, you know, if, if we integrated these two other systems together, then maybe the frontline person doing the referral when they're really stuck, you know, and they've just, they're like, oh, we've, you know, we've sent this person to these two places. It just hasn't worked out for them. Is maybe somebody else's database has another answer, you know? So, I mean, that's where I envision it going so that, and it's again, it's more system integration. It's making sure that the, the tools they use are really where they can find this so that they don't have to go to five places. You have to convince them they're getting something out of it. It's making their lives easier. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, it, it needs to, to make their lives easier, right? That's, that's a big part. It has of to it. have a, s a track record. Yeah. Otherwise yeah. it's not gonna work. And that's why pilots are so important, right? We don't want to start mm -hmm. huge because we got to actually start small. But, you know, getting really good feedback, some of which it's like, you know, okay, your baby's ugly. Okay, we'll make the baby better. Um, but, you know, it's <laughs> important. We got to hear that stuff. There is no ugly baby. <laughs> <laughs> there were some okay. ugly pages of the baby, I got to say. They're better now. But ah. <laughs> <laughs> another, another question. Hi, uh, my name's Amy Price with the Zellerbeck Family Foundation. Um, I'm curious when we, I, I feel like when we're talking about users, we're talking about the, the employees, the users of the system. And I'm curious if any, I often hear from some of the groups that we work with um, that they, some of the base building groups, some of the organizing groups that, that people are coming to them saying, help, I need help managing all of my court mandated case managers. They're sending mm -hmm. me to this organization. They don't understand me. They can't help me. So I'm wondering if, um, from the tech perspective, if the user experience, and by user I mean the, the clients, the, the actual people we're trying to help, um, if that's reflected in there so we get a sense of why are we funding that organization that none of these people you know, it's not really helping any of these people. Like, to understand those referrals aren't working, why are they not working? Is it because people aren't, you know, we, I think we tend to go with non-compliant um, clients instead of saying, what's wrong with that organization? So I'm curious from the tech perspective if the, the real user experience is reflected in that in any way. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I have like five other questions, but I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'll just do it super quick and hand yeah. it over. Uh, but I would say that for us, and again, that's one of the problems of being one step removed, right, is because we're not dealing with that end user real person we're trying to benefit at the end. But it's all about quality and timeliness. So, and that's where we need to work continually with our partners to say, how did those referrals go? Do you have better information? You know, certainly we want to make them more efficient and happy as well. Did it was it easier to update your data? Because that's just going to lead to better referrals. If somebody has is getting referred to a shelter and they really mm. know that they are eligible and that there's a space for them, 
I mean, that is huge. That is way different than, oh, I went there, I took three buses, and I'm kind of on my last thread of gusto, and I didn't get in. Yeah. You know, that is a disaster. Then you have, sometimes you have then a shelter bed not being used and a person sleeping on the street because the data wasn't updated. Ouch. But, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd love to, Kelly, he I know probably also, mm -hmm. and Aaron have inputs on that. Go ahead. Um, and w I could speak to what we're doing in Santa Clara County, more um, a bit separate from, from Benetech, but as part of our, our uh, investment, around homelessness in Santa Clara County, we did commission a study to understand, you know, the state of things uh, in terms of landscape assessment for technology and um, where there were gaps and where there were opportunities. And one that came out loud and clear was <laughs> how to communicate with people that, you know, to know for them to access information, access their documents, do e-signatures for release of information, um, make appointments with their case manager, be able to communicate to... Um, what else? I, I mean, basically, just have access to their to their identity doc like documents. All exactly, all of that. Um, there's not that client-facing portal in HMIS um, currently, or at least the HMIS that's used um, in Santa Clara County. So that's what we're now working to develop with the HMIS provider is a client-facing portal where where people are more empowered with their information and where there is an opportunity to be able to have more of a two-way information flow through technology. Um, I had one other, one, oh, the other, I mean, what I was telling Ke Kevin about earlier was also um, a direct service provider that, that we partner with where we went to visit to, to look at where there are opportunities to digitize their operations and there's no shortage of opportunity there as well. I mean, people wait, go there. I mean, so many people have multiple jobs, single heads of household, they go there, they take a number and they wait, and then they fill out these forms, and they fill out an enrollment form, and then they're eligible for one service, they fill out another form, and it's all the same information. <laughs> they All these paper forms that are then entered into different databases, there's a several month backlog before that's entered. There's no real benefit to the the client or the user at all. Um, and so there's so much opportunity there also where they could make appointments, where there could be more um, uh, ways to fill out information where it's, you know, fill out the same, like, same information once and have that um, populate different databases. Um, so we're also looking at opportunities there to really minimize the time and pain that so many clients go through to just uh, access services. I have to say that one, one benefit or, uh, or outflow effect of, ha of a system like this is you'll be able to see what works and what doesn't. And that mm -hmm. can be scary That's to people. You. It's a little yep. capitalistic. Mm -hmm. the, the, the people that aren't getting it done are going to get, uh, yeah. will be exposed. Yep. And what you really need, what I've, I've seen in, well, New York, Denver, Houston, is, is the, the places uh, where you have someone who's got a steel spine, who's in charge, can say, okay, you're out. You know, that's not working, this is. And that, uh, that's a tough thing to, 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 that's a tough decision to do. But it, it exposes you to, to that when you participate in something like this. It also exposes you to showing your success and showing your effectiveness. And that's what you have to aim for. I think, are we done? Oh, we got one more question? Oh, here we go. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Jeff. Um, Actually, a similar question. So I think having more efficient referral systems and better client records is incredibly important and valuable to the client and the case manager. But at the end of the day, like homelessness is because of a lack of housing. Um, and so my, my question is, um, how are you, can you or are you using this technology to, number one, help uh, deal? Because my job is essentially rationing um, a limited amount of resources. We don't have the same problems where it takes 365 days because of an inefficient system. We have problems where it takes five years because we don't have enough housing. Mm -hmm. um, so my job is to figure out how to best use the resources that we have as effectively as we possibly can, and then use data that we're generating to make some of the hard decisions, like what's the best way to use the resources we have more effectively because Frankly, uh, more efficient referrals, that's great, but that's not really at the crux of, or at least around mm -hmm. homelessness in big cities in the United States. It's how do you effectively ration and utilize what you have 
uh, to serve people as best as you possibly can, frankly, knowing you're not going to be able to serve um, everyone, and, and what data are you generating with your system to be able to help people like me and other policymakers uh, better, better decide how to use those resources? Yeah, sell it, Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if I could wave a magic wand and build housing, uh, it would be a sh short discussion. And, and I want to make sure Kelly gets in on this, too, because you're mm -hmm. right in the middle of a lot of this kind of stuff. I mean, where we see ServiceNet going is, again, because it's much more of a net, uh, being co a connector, that obviously the idea that you're doing a lot of referrals, but then how much are those crossing all these lines, right? So we talked about the fact that there are different maybe ring fence systems and what do you do when you go outside there? You know, you can learn a lot when you have some data about that. And, and again, we have to be a little careful that there, there's one set of issues specifically around housing, but you know, we're also looking at the broad social safety net. So not just somebody's housing issues, but you know, do they need counseling? Do they need food? Do they need you know, assistance paying their utility bills once they have housing? You know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's a lot to learn about all of those, you know, determinants that might keep people from becoming homeless, keep people from losing the housing they have. And I think, you know, where do services need to be located? A lot of us in this space, I mean, if you know the city, you're like, well, yeah, it'd be really great if we had a, you know, a drug counseling center here and we don't. But actually, that's not always that visible for all these services. So, so I do think there's an opportunity long term for how this data really tells a story of what's happened. You think about, are people crisscrossing the city? Are they crisscrossing three counties? Uh, you know, I think together, it's not just ServiceNet. It's the kind of work that Sherry's doing in one degree and other groups. We can actually learn a lot from that data without you know, hurting mm -hmm. the privacy side of people. And I yeah, one of the holy grails is finding out where is the housing that is available? How can you get your hands on yeah. it? How can you make it affordable? How, how, do, how does this help? Yeah, so I, 211s actually um, track unmet needs. Um, some of us better than others in terms of, you know, how it's categorized. And many say that 211s could have predicted the foreclosure crisis. Um, because we were seeing so many calls early on about not being able to pay your mm -hmm. mortgage that had gone up. Um, I think that there, some 2-1-1s are better at tracking repeat callers. Like you're saying, like, if I get a call about this and this and this, and I know that's probably going to equal someone who can't pay their rent or on the verge of uh, eviction or something that's happened, they lost their job. There are, of course, there's these indicators that we could report. I think the um, there is, a, you know, we need big data for that. I think um, that, and this is even on the caller user data, not on the resource data side. Uh, many 2-1-1s have that. Many 2-1-1s are using that really well. I think some of the, like, less resource 2-1-1s aren't using that well. You have a team that's updating your data. You have a team that's answering the calls. You have a team that's doing the partnerships and fundraising. But do you have a data analytics team that's looking at this very big picture and analyzing it across? I know 2-1-1 um, here, here in the in the Bay Area, we have two and ones that are looking at repeat caller, are looking at what are the needs, um, offering you know sort of those proactive or push information and referral, right? Not just waiting for someone to ask me something, but if I know that if someone calls about this resource, they might be on this path, and I suggest a connection to something that could be useful to them, um, you know that that's where we should be. We should be the am right. I, if you're on Amazon and you bought a thing and I know other people buy that other thing, I should be able to do that with, you know, just like the, in the other spaces that we live in, we should be able to say, you are on this track and we want to stop that and we want to prevent it. So, I mean, I think there is some data, not necessarily the resource data. Um, I mean, it would all be strengthened, you know, in your, the question about feedback loop, I think all of that, if we could, you know, have that from users, um, make it better, um, more reliable data. But, um, what I'm hearing is mostly about uh, preventing people from falling out of housing, which I know is a big goal of, of, of Jeff's. Uh, how about identifying new housing? Is that what you're thinking? preventing, thank you, on preventing homelessness. And in fact, most studies show that in order to prevent homelessness, you need to help prevent 10 people from being evicted to actually help one person mm -hmm. who would have become homeless otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a number of studies, Dr. Mary Beth Shin out of Vanderbilt, a study that was done in New York by APT Associates, you know, and no one has been able to crack that, that code yet. Um, so, 
That's part of it, but I think the other part is um, is being able to identify the highest needs clients in a community and make sure that they are going to the most expensive intervention first, and it's part of what we're trying to do in San Francisco. That so is. for us yeah. to give people yeah. permanent supportive housing, that costs the city, costs anybody who's a taxpayer uh, and lives in San Francisco about $350,000 per person. Mm -hmm. So if I can solve somebody's problem for $5,000, I should not be solving it giving them a $350,000 intervention because, you know, we have half of the permanent supportive housing in the Bay Area, even though we have 23% of the Bay Area's homeless population. So the burden on the city and the city's general fund is becoming a little bit too great for us to be able to bear. So we have to use what we have as effectively as we possibly can because we've invested so heavily and have not bent the curve, frankly, and I hope Santa Clara and other counties will you know, learn from us, we have more permanent support, more housing for homeless people per capita than any other city in the world, not just the United States, in the world. However, we have not been able to bend the curve on the problem because we're not using what we have very efficiently. I think there's other other reasons, um, and that's that's more what I was I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, and, and the prevention frees up that expensive housing. Yeah, uh, it, for the it does. But we're most. not even. This using is what I'm hearing: yeah. is the is yep. the prevention the is key. Although, the, but the prevention yeah. part so far has been impossible to predict. Yeah. No one has been able to do it. There is like nobody can convince me at this point that you've got data that's going to show how to prevent homelessness because it's been looked at nationally by people who have been studying this for 25 yeah. years mm -hmm. and they have not been able to crack that that code yet. But we do know um, we don't use our, our resources very efficiently, and it's not just about the client that took 360 days and it could have taken 60. It's really about the client where we could have solved the problem for 5,000 bucks, but instead mm -hmm. we spent 350,000 bucks, and then you got the guy who's you know, walking around the Bayview, schizophrenic for 15 years, nobody knows that person's name because he doesn't have the ability to navigate a complex right. system. And that's, you know, I think that there's a lot of utility in this work in terms, because this is, nobody wants to hear this, but it is just the truth. And if we don't say the truth, and I'll try to be that steely spined person, we don't have enough stuff to solve this problem. We just don't. Um, we live in the most expensive, one of the most expensive real estate markets in the in the country, and we don't have enough stuff, but we do have the ability to stop people from dying on the streets. And you um, can mitigate it with, a, with, with better data, better absolutely, information, absolutely. like that what I'm hearing right. here. By efficiently using yeah. what we have, we can at least exactly. make sure uh -huh. that people who are going to die get the housing first. And it's sad yeah. to yeah. have to Coordinated do it. our job and that way, but that's essentially the... That was that was kind of my that was my yeah. question. I hear you. And there has been a, a pretty successful homelessness prevention system pilot in Santa Clara County, where there's now 15 different uh, emergency agency networks that are part of it. They have a you know standardized kind of mm. prevention VI spadat mm. um, that they use, and they're I think the average uh, cost per individual or household is four thousand. So compare that to once it they're is. on the street. Um, where they are trying to, uh, part of the problem is there's not enough money, but they are trying to identify them. They're working with Leo out of Notre Dame, so they know that like a third are victims of domestic abuse. So they now added more service providers that are working with those populations. They um, they are using data. It's not predictive necessarily, but they're they're working also with the hotlines that basically could only help you if you're homeless. So, you know, they'd say, I'm at the verge of becoming homeless, and they'd say, we can't help you until you are. Um, and connecting them to systems providers to, to provide homelessness. No, it, it is consistent. It's like the 5,000 bucks Jeff is talking about, because I've heard that in 4, Santa Clara over and, and over. And it's bucks. legal aid support. Yeah. It's case management. Mm -hmm. It's not just one-time financial assistance, but it's, you know, basically whatever it takes to, to keep, keep someone remain stably housed. Which then frees up uh, one of the more expensive slots. Yeah, you yeah. I mean, I just I think I think what you're driving at, and it's it's this answer. It is collaboration. We cannot work in silos. Yeah. They're smart, great people. We've got to work together. And I I mean, the thing that makes me optimistic, even in the face of a lot of issues, is it's 2019. We have people, you know, throw a stone and hit people who are amazing doing amazing work with data so stuff that you couldn't predict 25 years ago mm -hmm. i will predict that within five years there will be a predictive algorithm maybe within two right so that's hopeful but if we don't work together and share data and stuff like you're never going to get there because your algorithm won't have enough data to to even know the answer so 
I think there's hope in that. Well, one of the tricks is to keep your hope up, like Jeff asked to, when the streets don't empty. People say, what the hell are you doing? It's not fixed. Mm -hmm. You, you got to keep trying anyway, yeah. right? Are we done? I think we are. I think the clock rang. That's it. Thank you very much. I, I was very happy to lead this panel. Thank you Thank for you. being here. Thank I appreciate you. that.